Great. Hello, everyone. I'm Calvin Reed, Senior News Editor of Publishers Weekly, editor of PW Comics World, PW's online coverage of comics and graphic novel publishing. And I'm also a co-host on More to Come, PW's weekly podcast on comics and graphic novel publishing. But I'm also pleased to welcome all of you to the 2020 Brooklyn Book Festival online, a little different uh, platform this year, but uh, still exciting and still doing what the Brooklyn Book Fair does so well is to bring artists uh, together to talk about their works. Uh, we're here today with a great trio of artists. We're going to start off with, with Dave Chisholm, uh, M.A. Burrell, and of course, Joe Sacco. Uh, before we begin, I think there's going to be a link somewhere where you can actually purchase uh, the books uh, that we're going to be talking about. So, uh, you know, please indulge. I just want to tell you a little bit about the panel. All right, it's called Makers of the Road, Writing Hidden History. And what we're going to look at is three authors who skillfully use the graphic medium to really investigate uh, our, the culture of different personalities. It's really creative graphic nonfiction at its best. All right, let's start all over again. Dave Chisholm, Chasing the Bird, uh, Charlie Parker in California, a really, I think, a groundbreaking uh, book that looks into the life and the music of really one of the most revered uh, and influential alto saxophonist com com composers uh, in the history of, of jazz. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about that and the book and, where, and, and, um, uh, and how they put it together. Next, we're gonna be talking with uh, M.A. Burrell, whose work, We Serve the People, My Mother's Story, uh, really is a fascinating look at the, uh, the Chinese Cultural Revolution. Uh, through the life of really one person, and in particular, a woman. Uh, with, with very, very particular demands and very, and really an extraordinary story of personal determination. And then, of course, uh, Joe Sacco, uh, uh, acclaimed uh, comics journalist, uh, his most recent book, Paying the Land, uh, really a look at the Native uh, Indigenous people of Canada, their history, their struggles, and in fact, their, their, the, the complex landscape that they exist in now between their history and the demands of uh, both the Canadian government and the contemporary world. So look, uh, uh, that's a quick synopsis. Uh, I'm gonna go down the line and let you talk a little bit more about your books. Uh, so look, thanks you all for being here. And uh, let's start off uh, with Dave. Um, uh, <clears throat> Dave, tell us a little bit. You, first of all, just to make sure people understand what we're talking about, can you tell us a little bit about Charlie Parker. I know this is a name that people may recognize, but I'm not sure people always understand the impact that he's had on, on 20th century uh, American music. Yeah, uh, Charlie Parker uh, was a saxophonist who um, was, was mainly active as an artist in the um, 40s and 50s. And he's an innovator in the jazz medium. Um, he played saxophone, like you said, and he's, um, largely credited with being one of the key figures for like advancing jazz music past the swing era into like bebop and kind of transforming jazz from like uh, commercial music to more like art music. Um, and when, and you know, like I, well, we'll get into it. I, I, uh, I have a lot of, I have like th three degrees in jazz music. And when you study jazz music and jazz improvisation, I would say like 80% of what you study really can be traced back to Charlie Parker's innovation. So he's this, and he's this incredibly um, influential figure and made all the more remarkable by the fact that he died at age 34, uh, pretty young. So he's a fascinating historical figure. And he's a, he's, a, he's a revolutionary musician at a time when it was incredibly difficult for black musicians in particular uh, to be more than entertainers. Right, 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 right. Yeah, that was kind of the, the, um, you know, unspoken agenda of these, of these, like, so-called, like, bebop musicians. Um, they kind of got fed up with the, like, poor conditions for Black musicians who are touring through America and the dangerous, oftentimes dangerous conditions. And they, um, these musicians largely congregated in New York City in Harlem and the music became again more or less like a like built on virtuosity built on 
uh, excellence and almost like built on being this incredibly ha having like an incredibly difficult like point of entry into the music to kind of be like a like a secret handshake almost mm -hmm. um yes yeah, so the the legend of bebop uh uh, uh the legend around uh, mitten's playhouse uh in harlem uh, and the uh, the legend of uh, musicians like Dizzy Gillespie, who we'll talk about a little bit more, who figures very prominently uh, right. in the book. All right, so we're, we're going to get back to you. So uh, more to come on that. All right, uh, uh, Ime, uh, tell us a little bit about your book, because it's a, a, really a, the story of your mother. Yeah, it's um, kind of a retelling and comic format of the stories that me and my brother grew up with. Well. Mm -hmm. Like, it was the stories that she always told us of her life growing up in China and everything she went through. Um, because she was 17 when the Cultural Revolution started. So we would hear a lot about comparisons about what happened before it took place and then all the struggles that her and like my grandparents went through during those like 10 years and afterwards. So I felt that it was a very like captivating story um, and wanted to retell it in the graphic novel format. Uh, just share a little bit of those, like the twists and turns that sure. human life can take when there's chaos around you and basically you have no say in what's going to be happening um, with your life. So tell us a little bit about it. I mean, obviously, uh, I'm sure our audience knows who Mao, Mao Zedong is, the, the, the chair of the of the Communist Party in China from 1950 till I think he died in the mid 1970s. But yeah. but, may, but maybe they don't know exactly what the Cultural Revolution is. So maybe because and you talk about it, you give a you kind of a, a broad uh, you know definition of it uh, uh, in in the book. So tell us tell our listeners what was the Cultural Revolution. So it was this decade long movement that basically threw China into a very long time of turmoil and chaos. And it was started by Chairman Mao in uh, 1966 and went on until he died in 1976. And it was, like a re-education of the entire society it was to it was supposed to breathe new life into like communism um and it was also a tool for Mao Zedong to kind of clear out his opponents within the party and in society so they wanted to like throw out all the old things like all the bourgeoisie thoughts like all the devel developments towards capitalism and just break and burn the old and bringing new like communist thoughts um and this affected everybody in society from like the most rich landowners to like the poorest peasants um so everybody's life kind of came to a stop because everybody was supposed to be re-educated with maoist thought um and like set the country on a new path um and yeah. your, I mean, your book is called We Serve the People, My Mother's Story. And this is your mother's um, experience. I mean, she was... She was, she was uh, part of it, yeah. And yeah. I mean, there were many people who were, were, were sent to the, uh, the countryside. Yeah, so a part of the communist revolution that affected um, young people, basically, was called the Up to the Mountains and Down to the Countryside movement, which was a nationwide movement where... Um, and I, I think a quote from Mao Zedong was, we want to send urban youth, educated youth, out to the countryside to learn from the poorest farmers what China really is. So I think all of the students that lived in major cities around China were relocated from their homes to various parts across China where they were uh, supposed to live and work and learn from farmers. Um, but the thing is, um, there is this domestic passport system in China that still exists, um, which means that um, it's really, it like stops uh, rural to urban uh, migration. So basically, if you leave, you move from a bigger city, it's almost impossible for you to move back into like from the countryside so these students knew that if they were leaving their homes for the countryside it would be like 
almost no chance that they would ever move back. Um, so this was like a huge movement that affected that whole generation and she was part of that and was sent from her home in Beijing to like the rubber plantations down in the south of China where she was stuck for 10 years basically. And it's really a remarkable story. We're going to return to that because I really want you to talk some more. I mean, your mother's life is absolutely remarkable. Her, de her determination uh, and her ambition is off the hook, off the scale. Uh, so we're going to return to that. But we're going to jump right now to uh, Joe. Um, I know, I, I'm sure most of the people out here are familiar with your work, Palestine, um, uh, 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 Safe Air Garage, Footnotes in Gaza. Uh, I mean, you, you've done something very similar though not a war zone, at least not a war, uh, um, uh, other, not like the wars perhaps you've covered in the past, but in some ways a, a different kind of war. Uh, can you give us an overview of paying the land and, and what you're doing maybe and how it relates to some of your past words? Okay, well, um, uh, thanks for that. Uh, paying the Land is a book about a trip I took up the Mackenzie River Valley uh, to meet indigenous people, the Dene people in the Northwest Territories. And it started out sort of as a book about resource extraction and how it affects indigenous people. That was my initial idea. But when I got up there, I realized it, there was a bigger theme. It was about colonialism. Um, and uh, the book ends up being about how the Canadian government um, basically had to, once they found resources up there, uh, they had to formalize their relationship over the people. And that was done uh, by a number of methods, basically by treaties in which the indigenous people supposedly gave up, yielded their rights to their, the land, what was on the land under it. And also by breaking people from the land, uh, that's another way of controlling them. And the main way that was done was through the residential school system, which took children from their parents and really without telling the parents where they were going, would fly them to different schools around the Northwest Territories and other parts of Canada. And in the schools, they basically regimented the children, uh, beat them if they spoke their languages, uh, just basically tried to Christianize them and turn them into some form of a Western, Western person. And obviously, when these kids returned to their communities, there was a, a great alienation from their communities. Often they couldn't even speak to their uh, grandparents anymore. They couldn't speak the language and they were cut off from what they knew. So it's a story of, basically it's a book about what happened to the people, um, the after effects of colonialism, the continuing effects of colonialism and how people are trying to resist that. Okay, well, that, this is great. I, I'm, I'm going to return to you because I want to, uh, I want to, uh, I want what you to maybe to pull some of the personalities out that you talk with and how they illustrate that. So we're going to do it, but we're going to jump back to Dave right now. And um, uh, Dave, I want, you've structured this, uh, this graphic biography of Charlie Parker around a specific time uh, in his life. Yeah, um, a, a trip to California. Uh, I mean, I, I, I do want people to understand a little bit about uh, the context. I mean, Bird was a brilliant uh, and transformative force, uh, but he was also, he had his demons. Uh, and you created this real, uh, this fascinating structure of associates. This, I don't want to say that word Rashomon, but I'm going to, I just said it. But it's a, there's a sort of a 360 degree look through but well, you talk about it. How how have you structured the book, and uh, and what what do these associates talk about? Uh, the book is structured in in six vignettes, and an, and then like an introduction and an like an outro, um, and the each vignette is narrated by a different a different person whose life intersected with Charlie Parker's life during the time when he was in California. Uh, the the idea to constrain the story to this period, this brief period of time was uh, actually part of the, part of the, when I was approached to do this, it, it wasn't like my idea to do this, but I'm really glad that this was the case because it's a lot easier. It was, it, it was a lot easier to dive deep in like a two year span as opposed to try to like cover, you know, his entire life. Um, and so uh, 
and this was intended to um, explore the fact that like with Charlie Parker in history, um, you get like an idea of Charlie Parker, the man and of Bird, the legend. And there's so yes. many small tales about Bird that, that, uh, that, that, that exists that, that, that kind of like, and so many differing accounts, so many different stories of like what he was like. Um, and there's not a ton of interviews that exist of Char where Charlie Parker's being interviewed. And even when he was interviewed, he was a really brilliant guy and was, had a, had a big sense of humor. And, I, and, and you get the sense that he was kind of tr almost trolling the interviewer sometimes when he was being interviewed. He was this really clever person. And so um, the way the book is structured with these different vignettes, it lets, lets, us ex lets the reader kind of see like a bunch of different sides of Charlie Parker without any of them coming down as definitive like this is exactly who he was because I it wouldn't I don't think it would be even be possible for me to make that kind of statement, uh, and when I when I was putting it together, um, I knew I wanted to I wanted each vignette to be told with with a different art art style to reflect the point of view of the person telling the story. So Dizzy Gillespie's vignette is this really dynamic, um, this really like dynamic art style, whereas like this. Um, this European artist who's narrating a chapter, his style is maybe is a bit more indebted to European kind of comic mm -hmm. art. So there's a lot of like odes to other comic artists in it as well. Um, there's a cha there's a chapter that's narrated by uh, this character Ross Russell, who sure. was um, who was Charlie's manager for a while. Mm -hmm. And Ross, in a previous earlier in his life, tried to make it as a pulp novelist, and so I, so it was it was perfect for me to kind of pay homage to. Darwin Cook and and try to make mm -hmm. make this chapter reflective of like Darwin Cook's book Parker. A great noir influenced comics artist who who sadly has passed away. Right. Yeah. Um, and um, and yeah, this kind of like uh, this really allowed me to explore like a lot of different points of view of Charlie Parker, and again also explore the kind of like the, the faulty memory sort of like people's memories combining different events together and uh, play a little bit more loosely with, um, with history, probably more so than either of the other two folks on this, uh, on this panel. One thing I'd like to jump in to talk about is that they, it, it, I mean, this is an authorized biography because the Charlie Parker estate, right, mm -hmm. uh, is, you know, is, did give its approval. But from what I've understood, they were very open. I mean, this is a very creative and not always flattering portrait of Bird. Bird was was brilliant, but he was deeply troubled at the same time. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, they, they, I mean and we, and you, we have to talk about this. I mean, uh, dope and, and, and alcohol uh, were, had a, just an awful effect on his life. And you, it's very difficult. And you managed to do it. Oh, yeah, to, yeah. Um, to document his troubles without it um, exploiting. ignoring his genius. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, um, it was definitely, uh, the, the, the estate didn't want the book to be like graphic in depictions of things, but there's no way to tell the story of Charlie Parker without tackling this idea of his, of, of his addiction, his addictions and his troubles like with addiction. And, um, you know, our culture has like American culture has a really frustrating relationship with the, with addiction, and uh, I really wanted to kind of a, to, to to look at it as an exploration of like like what the circumstances were that led to this person being an addict, and the fact that like really that this obsessed part of his personality that led him to be such a transcendent, brilliant musician is also probably the cause like a huge part of that obsession like led to maybe some less than savory parts of sure. his life as well. And of course, the fact that he's living in a period of the most vicious American racism you can imagine. Totally. Yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's, it's amazing. It, 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 it's heartbreaking to think about what this guy could have been if he wasn't like in an environment that never allowed him to have rest, that never allowed him to escape. Um, and, and when you really look at all of his various obsessions, <laughs> and addictions it was always about like escaping the the escaping kind of the prison of his mind or the prison that and and all how his whole environment created that prison in his mind um 
and and then trying to find angles to tell put that in a comic book you know and like <laughs> i'm gonna jump in here we're gonna get back to that right now let's jump to uh uh to, uh, to ma tell us more about <laughs> your mother um <laughs> Uh, I mean, I mean, and also the context of women in China at this time. I mean, she was a truck driver, a tractor driver. Uh, tell us more about your mother. Uh, I mean, I guess after she lands in uh, at the rubber plantation. Yeah, um, I think that an interesting thing that she kind of prefaced that with was like, as they arrived in the south of China, took four days with train to go from Beijing, her hometown there, like. When she finally arrived, where she was going to be spending the indefinite future, future like the main feeling she had was like this was a mistake, and my one goal in life is to go home, no matter what. Like Get I have back no to clue. Beijing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like I have no clue how that's going to work, but that is like that's the that was like the thing she said that drove all of her decisions going forward from there, and basically. Um, yeah, they were just like they got different, um, like they were they got distributed work, um, and it was just like working on the mountains, like tilling the ground, like tapping rubber trees from rubber, and just making these things. Um, and what happened for her, like, was that there was a series of events where she had angered some of her superiors who were really petty about things, and they tried to like throw her under the bus, but then somebody else picked on, up on like, okay, she's actually a very dedicated worker. So we're gonna give her a chance to become first a tractor driver and then a truck driver. And she was like the first and one of very few women who were like driving trucks or tractors down in the South of China at, in these situations at the time. Um, and she, she met a lot of like, um, I guess, uh, resilience from both men and women like obviously this was like almost 50 years ago and all societies were more conservative uh and like gender biases and stuff like that uh at the point but she i thought it was interesting because it was like a very male dominated um work so the other drivers were questioning why would you hire a woman to do something like that and also like from her female friends they were like but that is a really it's really dangerous for a woman to be like driving in the mountainside like why would you want to do something like that and what she always told me was like i don't see why it would be more dangerous for me than a man or for anybody else like why can't i do this um basically um so <laughs> she always had this like sense of just doing things her way um and <laughs> In many, at many, like she got some opportunities that I didn't mention in the book, but that would have led her to transfer into the city and work there as a chauffeur or something similar. But um, as going home to Beijing was her main goal, she said no to most of these opportunities because she knew that a relocation like that would then divert her and she wouldn't be able to go home. So it was the sense of like, there's something good happening here, but I know. I need to stay on track for my main goal of going home. And that was what, like, a similar thing that drove her back when the Cultural Revolution finally ended and everybody was released home. Like, then her goal turned to pursuing education because she, her education was interrupted when she was in the seventh grade. So she felt this, like, shame of being 27, but the, having the educational level of a like a 14 year old, like a middle schooler. So again, it was this like drive to always stay on this path of pursuing this one thing that she had decided that she would get no matter what. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold yeah. you up there because I do want to return to her education because yeah. also remarkable <laughs> what she accomplished. <laughs> Absolutely jaw break. Now, is, is your mother still alive? Yes, yes. She is? Oh, oh yeah. sorry. Yeah. Even more awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I, I do want to ask just a little bit. She does seem to have been fortunate to encounter male supervisors that seem to see past, you know, some of the kind of like uh, sabotage, for want of a better way to describe yeah. it, she re often received from other supervisors or from. So we, uh, can you just say a little bit about that? Because at every juncture, she seems to be 
when the odds are against her, she seems to find a mentor. Yeah, it's this like weird stroke of luck, right? If that one supervisor who wasn't easily bribed or easily like, you know, turned over by all the rumors um, and didn't take her part, she would have had an incredibly hard time and just not have actually been able to pursue any of these opportunities. Um, yeah, it's it's really interesting, like for all the kind of bad eggs, there are an equal amount of like good eggs out there to kind of weigh it out, <laughs> if you know what I mean. Um, but it does show like that there's just um, a deep, I feel in a ways from these stories, what I read into it is that there is a deep sense of corruption and like in uh, like all of the levels where it's like, okay, you, you're supposed to do it this way. You're supposed to bribe me, you know, like I'm not going to help you unless you do this favor for me. And if you then try to do things like, you know, I, I buy you this thing and then I ask you for money afterwards because I did you a favor. Then it's like, okay, you want to go like the correct way? Yeah, I'm going to like mess things up for you in that case. Well, um, I, I remember yeah. the, the, the uh, section uh, about learning how to drive the tractor uh, uh, and the, the mentor getting rid of the two old guys. And, you know, yeah. it's, like, it's no, so... Yep. Yeah. But I'm going to return to you because yeah. I do want you to talk about her education, which is just extraordinary, and another mentor there, actually, that rescued her in some ways. But let's, let's jump to Joe uh, because, I mean, one of the things in, in, in Paying the Land is you, you, you really talk you talk to a uh, to several generations of native leaders, and the book opens, I think, uh, with Paul Andrews. Uh, and then later in the book, you really sort of survey uh, survey both a new generation of young people and perhaps some potential leaders. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about uh, uh, Paul Andrews, who's opened the books, and some other personalities in the book that provide some insight into uh, the life and the future, I guess, of Native peoples in Canada. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Paul Andrew is uh, one of those great people you meet uh, on travels like this, where they sit down in front of you and you realize this is the person around whom you can you can really structure a, a large part of the book. Um, he was very generous to me. Uh, we we sat down so we could talk about residential schools, which I mm -hmm. I know was going to be hard for him. And later on, I found out he had, you know, quite a lot of doubts about even venturing into it with me. But what was really uh, great about the conversation is he didn't start there. He started with uh, the story of growing up in the bush. And, you know, what, what readers will find out is that people about my age, and I'm, I'm close to 60 now, uh, readers about my age in the Northwest Territories. <laughs> Over 60, but go on. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm about a week away. Okay, so, welcome um, to the club. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Well, you know, people my age would have grown up in the bush, would have, would have spent uh, part of our childhood if we were up there living. So he could relate what it was like to grow up in these communities as they existed at that time. And clearly, from everything he was telling me, you could tell the sense that he felt he had a real purpose within his community, that he understood exactly who he was as an individual and individuality was encouraged, but also the, the family group, uh, they were basically semi-nomadic people, was, was really strong and everyone knew their place within the community. It was uh, a very strong way to grow up and it was all related to the land and how they felt about the land and what the land gave to them. So the book starts with him explaining these, just, just what life was like, mm -hmm. you know, um, living seasonally, hunting uh, animals for fur and bringing them into the small towns around every now and then. Really, they spent most of their time living in the bush and really hard, but by my standards, pretty hard conditions, <laughs> yeah. you know, 40 degrees below centigrade. Um, so, and their migrations. The, I mean, you talk about that quite a bit too. Um, yeah, they would go up and down the Mackenzie River Valley. You know, if fish were running, they would go to where the fish were running. They would meet every now and then in, in hamlets 
to have weddings, just to, to reacquaint themselves with their relatives in different parts of the mountains. And, um, you know, he talked about making a moose skin boat and how they would, in, in a few days, they would pick the trees, get the sap, um, tan, you know, skin the hides of the, of the moose and create a boat that they could sail, they could basically just go down the river in. Um, so it was, it was just a beautiful story because it, it, it sets up the premise of the book, which, which is basically, so what's changed? How has it changed? How did Canada manage to, to, to break this or attempt mm -hmm. to destroy this and why? So he was a very good person to, to begin the book with. And then he, he sort of brought me through the residential school system and his experiences with it and how he was um, just basically hammered into being a Westerner. Mm. But he never really became a Westerner because ultimately he has a very good critique of the West and what it, um, uh, what it did to his culture. In fact, when I was listening to him, it, it, it sounded like he'd been reading Franz Fanon. You know, I mean, he really has a great critique. Um, and then that has extended over to the, a newer generation of younger people who didn't grow up on the land, who realize what's happened, also have a very strong critique and are trying to more self-consciously rebuild their Dene identities. And it's a struggle for them because they have to relearn the language. They have kids themselves and they can't really transmit the language to their kids without learning it themselves. They have to, you know, a lot of them have grown up in towns um, so they don't even know the land. They have to sort of put themselves on the land, learn how to hunt caribou, just learn how to be a Dene person. So, but, but they are struggling uh, toward that. And they do have a very good understanding of what's happened to them. Very quickly, uh, I, I, if you could comment on the, the other point you made earlier about how treaties were used. Maybe you could talk a little bit about the burger inquiry. inquiry. Yeah, well, the Berger inquiry was uh, something that happened in the 70s. Uh, there was a natural gas pipeline, a, a proposed project, and uh, indigenous people basically wanted to assert themselves. And um, Berger was a Supreme Court justice uh, from British Columbia. And he went down, he went to the Northwest Territories and basically spent a couple of years finding out uh, what indigenous people thought about this project. And it's through that, through that inquiry that they began to talk a lot about what happened during the times of the treaty, how in the treaties took place in the 1890s and the 1920s in, in this particular case. And they basically, um, they never thought of the treaties as something, as they were giving up their land. They thought of them as friendship treaties. Yeah. And he began to bring these stories out and they told their stories. And so that it became a very seminal moment in their history when they began to sort of recognize themselves as uh, for who they were as Dene people, not as Indians. Yeah. Great. We're going to come back to you uh, because I, there's also some heartbreaking times where they're, they're grappling with modern culture uh, uh, beyond the ways that you're talking about. We're going to come back to that. Uh, we're going to jump back to Dave now. Dave, look. Uh, may I call you a unicorn? Uh, in some ways, uh, you're like, you know, if there is a some sort of jazz deity, they, they put you together to write this book. Uh, you're a cartoonist. Uh, you're a trumpet player. You, you have an, another book called Instrumental, also published by Z2, that I read a couple years ago and was impressed with. Uh, and then you're, a, you're an academic, you're a PhD. So tell us something about your background and how you bring all of these. This seems to be like, the project you were meant to do? You know, Calvin, I think it just boils down to like, it's gonna be a corny answer, but just time management. <laughs> okay. Uh, like, I've, and, and, and just like really having a very like lucky life where I've got, I've had the like privilege to be able to pursue my obsessions to like an extreme degree. And um, really just like, and just get completely carried away by my by my obsessions whether it's like music or comics you know but for me my background like the earliest music I ever I remember hearing in my whole life is my dad spinning Miles Davis sketches of Spain on the turntable when I was like three years old um, 
and then and then my mom to this day claims my first word was spider-man which is probably a like a total lie you know but she still claims that that's the way it is i don't remember it works for me and so like for me these are like two two threads through my life that have been there the whole like constantly and so um you know when this kind of when this opportunity fell into my lap it was it was a a real serendipitous confluence of my obsessions um and yeah i mean i couldn't have been more thrilled to like immerse in this project and it was a it was a really I've, i've never had a project that has come together so quickly and easily as this project did it was like just an absolute joy to make from beginning to end so well one of the things you've done i mean you really I mean, I mean, I don't know if you've done original research, but what you have done, you brought all of these uh, uh, narratives that you incorporate are sort of legendary. And actually, I'd like you to mention a, a couple more of them. I mean, I, I, uh, I knew about uh, uh, the party, the great party in L.A., the Zorthians party. Yeah. In, fact, in fact, rather than me jabber, I mean, mention some of the other accounts. You mentioned, uh, obviously, that Dizzy Gillespie opens the book with his uh, right. one of Bird's both great collaborators and his close friends. But tell us uh, some of the other names of people who uh, yeah, um, you the, tell the story the through. Zorthian Party. Zorthian is a Turkish artist that lived in the foothills of LA and had a ranch where he would, where he would like have these enormous parties with artists. And he invited Charlie to play, come play at a jam session. And Charlie, of course, showed up late and possibly like um, inebriated. And he wouldn't play music. He refused to play until a woman at the party promised that she would take her clothes off if he played. And so Charlie at that point was like, oh, please, like, let me play. Don't leave. I'll play. And, um, and yeah, this is a legendary party. It's all recorded. So, like, you hear them play the song Embraceable You, and you can hear people. It's not a, it's not a moment that has aged well in, like, the Me Too era. I mean, it's pretty, it, you know, but it, but but it's it's kind of remarkable to think of like and this is like the late 40s early 50s that there were people who were like truly counterculture that were under the radar do, having parties like this so so he played and then everybody allegedly everybody took their clothes off and <laughs> but he also met Julie McDonald there who he was did, also one of the right and another voices one of the, in this story this the, the sculpt Julie McDonald was his uh you know west coast girlfriend i guess he did not take um monogamy very seriously um maybe in a less than ethical way and uh you know her account of charlie parker is pretty small but it's absolutely fascinating she talks about charlie being interested in like mysticism and past lives and yoga which is again wild to think about someone exploring all this stuff during that time and how he was just like it seems like he opened up to her in a way that was different from anybody else there's a, when I was doing research, um, I came across this one line in a book that, that Charlie Parker played at a jam session in LA at Lester Young's house with a young John Coltrane who was on tour in California or in like the late forties. This is before Coltrane was anybody. And to imagine these three like, like legendary saxophonists, like that's the entire like book of like jazz saxophone in one event. Um, and all I could find was this one line in a book about this event. So um, I just kind of like read as many interviews as I could and tried to like piece this together and make it as, you know, I I wanted a chapter to be from the point of view of a saxophone player who like really idolized Charlie Parker. Um, Because Coltrane was one of the voices that are. Yep, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, And yeah, you know, William Claxton, the famous jazz photographer, um, Mm -hmm. he had a, this strange event where he, he went to hear Charlie Parker play, and then after the gig, Charlie was really hungry, but all the restaurants were closed. So he took Charlie to his parents' house in the suburbs, like 45 minutes away. Um, and Charlie ended up staying the whole weekend and eating all the food in the house. Um, and that... It's a, it's a very it, charming account. It really gives you insight into Bird's uh, uh, kind of humility and ability to relate to people that you don't hear very often. So I apologize. I'm going to interrupt you here because our time is is winding down and I really want to get a, a couple more comments. So I'm going to jump back to, to MA and I, I uh, tell us what TV University uh, was and how your mother used it to get an engineering degree. 
Um, so basically, by the time that she was back in Beijing, the Cultural Revolution had ended. She was 27. Um, and the problem was that they had just a couple of months like before this put in the rule that if you were age 27 and above, you could not um, study at university. So she felt that she had wasted all this time. She, re she wanted to catch up on lost time. She wanted to study. She wanted to go to university, but it was just impossible in the classical sense. Like she couldn't go to a normal university. But a friend got in touch with her and wrote a bunch of letters to her telling her about this thing called TV University that the government had set up for this lost generation, as they are called, the rusticated youth who were sent out to the countryside. And it was this, it was broadcast um, university courses that you could um, watch on TV, basically. Um, so if you were if you were working your your company that you worked for or the factory you worked for had to give you time to attend these classes if you wanted to study because you had lost so many years of your life um, so basically she got motivated by her friend to actually pursue this and give it a try but as the the case was it was that for anything you wanted to do basically at work you had to get permission from your superiors so she had to go to her two bosses um she was working as a chauffeur for a hospital um and she had to ask her two supervisors is it okay if i apply to see if i can even make it into tv university because my education stopped when i was 14 i don't even know if i can get accepted like but i would like to talk try and taste admission, take the admissions test and see if I can make it. And like, I'll just take whatever courses I get admitted to because it was in the sense that the degree was split up and she was like, maybe I'll qualify for only maths or only chemistry or only physics and then I'll take whatever. Um, but in the end, she had spent a lot of time just studying by herself at home. Um, and she managed to get into the entire like engineering degree that they offered at the university, which then got her into trouble because her superiors were like, what? No, you're supposed to like study one course. You're not allowed to do a full degree. Um, and they were afraid of losing a good worker. Yeah. Yeah. But the thing was like, they didn't have any work at the time because <laughs> okay. the hospital she was working for was under construction. So they didn't really have a lot of work for her. They were like three chauffeurs. She was like one of the three chauffeurs that worked there. And they were just sitting around. Like her colleagues were taking naps or drinking tea and reading the paper. And she was like, I just want to study. Like, can I use this time to do something that I feel is useful? But basically they were like, no, you broke the rules. You broke the rules that we set up arbitrarily. So we're just gonna make sure you can't make any of the classes. Um, so it would be like, oh, we need some nails to put up some lights. And there would be a hardware store that you could go to like five minutes bike, bike ride away. And they were like, hey, take this guy and drive across town to buy some nails. And she was like, are you sure we have to go to that one? They're like, yeah, I'm positive. You have to go to that specific store. And she would take this, this colleague, she would miss one of her classes, she would get back and would be like, am I done now? Can I go back to class? And they're like, oh, you didn't bring the receipt. You have to drive back and get the receipt. Sorry, kind of. And this went on for like a long time, basically, where they were trying to like make her miss every, every lesson from TV University. And then her in return would call in sick whenever there was an important person she needed to drive. She was like, okay, you want to play that game? Then she would just call in, oh, sorry, I'm sick. And there, it was like harder to find a chauffeur impromptu <laughs> rather than just send, send somebody on a bike to get like some nails for a lamp. So, yeah. Excuse me, I'm going to jump in because our time is running down. And I want to, yeah. but I, I'm, I'm going to add to your story that you're, 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 I, I think, uh, was it your mother's mother who would record this stuff? I mean, she would did everything in, to make sure she could get this degree, including uh, finding another mentor who got yeah. these guys off her back. But look, we're going to have to wind down here, but I want to jump back to, 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 to Joe to kind of, uh, um, kind of finish. I, I, I'd love to hear a little bit more about 
the I mean, what awaits these the, the these this new generation? I mean, uh, uh, the book highlights some of the challenges in the culture. I mean, uh, sexual abuse, uh, alcoholism, as they encounter this, as they try to balance off their their traditions and modern life. Uh, do you want to take us out here with uh, with what you encountered with this younger generation of uh, of uh, native people that you talk with? Well, I mean, ultimately, it's up to them sure. uh, what what happens. It, I, I, it's hard for me to forecast what's going to happen because I think it's it's well, really well, what they told you or what you saw in there. Yeah, their, yeah. Sure, I, I hear you. I think it's it's uphill, um, mm -hmm. but you do see some real determination uh, by some of these young people. You see some people who never really lost connection with their elders and can speak the language. Some of the younger people who've stayed in within their communities. But ultimately what you do have is, is people who have a really good sense of who they are, or at least trying to, to discover that. And so I think going forward, we'll see, you know, I mean, yeah. the Canadian government ultimately wants resources and it's, it's how they, how the indigenous people balance the claims of the Canadian government with, with uh, their own claims. And I mean, that story has to be told still. Well, look, um, I mean, uh, you've all uh, done a wonderful job here of telling these stories uh, and illuminating uh, these hidden histories. I want to thank you all. Uh, Dave Chisholm, uh, author of uh, Chasing the Bird, Charlie Parker in California. M.A. Burrell, uh, We Serve the People, My Mother's Stories. And of course, Joe Sacco, Paying the Land. Uh, <laughs> great books. Uh, there's a link somewhere. Click on it. Buy it. These are great books. Uh, it's just been a pleasure to talk to all of you. And uh, thanks for being a part of the 2020 Brooklyn Book Festival. Please consider making a donation to the Brooklyn Book Festival, which is celebrating its 15th year presenting free literary, literary program. Uh, there you go. All right. Thanks to all of you. This has been terrific. Thanks, Calvin. Thanks very much. Thank you.